Ever heard what a healthy underwater ecosystem sounds like? Listen to this. This is the sound of a coral reef that has undergone years of restoration in the coast of central Indonesia. These reefs had been destroyed because of a practice called dynamite fishing, in which fishermen would throw explosives in the ocean to kill large numbers of fish. But throwing an explosive in the ocean will kill a whole lot more than just fish. It will destroy an entire ecosystem. Coral reefs are among the most vulnerable and fragile ecosystems in the world, and one of the biggest threats to them worldwide isn't dynamite fishing. It's climate change. But what is coral reef degradation? Why is it important? And what does the sound of a healthy ocean have to do with climate change? This video seeks to answer those questions. My name is Simran Sirur and you're watching Tipping Point. According to a recent report published in the journal Nature Sustainability, all coral reefs in the Western Indian Ocean are at high risk of collapsing within the next 50 years because of global warming and overfishing. The study looked at 11,919 square kilometers of reef, which is approximately 5% of the global coral reef cover to arrive at its conclusions. Corals are extremely sensitive to temperature. If exposed to too warm a climate, their colorful exteriors turn white in what's called coral bleaching. Corals have a symbiotic relationship with an algae called zooanthellil. But when placed in hot water, there's an imbalance in this relationship and the coral expels this algae which causes it to lose its color and makes it more vulnerable to mortality. Once a coral reef is lost or bleached, reviving it can be extremely difficult. The world has lost nearly half its coral reef cover since the 1950s and there are efforts across the globe to conserve and restore the coral reefs that we have left. I spoke to Dr. Tim Lamont, a marine biologist with Lancaster University and a lead scientist with the Mars Coral Reef Restoration Project, which worked on the reefs of Indonesia. They came up with a model of coral reef restoration, whose fruits of labor you heard at the beginning of this video. The Mars Coral Reef Restoration Program has been working in central Indonesia for more than 10 years now and developing different ways, trying out different ways of restoring reefs. Um, what they've come up with that works really very well is called the reef star. So it's this hexagonal metal frame on which they tie lots of individual nubbins of coral, we call them fragments of coral. Uh, and then they can plant these frames next to each other. They fit together really well because they're hexagons. And you can cover a large area of the seabed with these frames. Uh, and that restores a large area of coral reef. The reason I think it works well is twofold. Firstly, because the frames themselves stabilize the seabed. They stop all of the old dead coral rubble from washing around and moving around. So they create a nice, strong, stable platform to allow coral growth. And then secondly, by lifting those coral fragments just a little bit off the seabed, up into the water column, it seems to really accelerate their growth. Maybe it's because there's more nutrients available to them, more water rushing past them. We don't know exactly why. Uh, but it seems to put these corals in a position in which they can grow very fast and grow very well. But looking at the growth of corals is just one measure of its success. Another is listening to what sounds come out of that ecosystem, which could serve as a truer indicator of how vibrant and diverse the reef actually is. <laughs> Uh, so we wanted to know in more depth whether these invisible animals that you can hear uh, at night or you can hear them because they're, they're hidden away so you don't see them but you hear their sounds, whether they had returned to the restored reef or not. Uh, and excitingly we found that they had. Uh, and so as well as looking like the reef had recovered, uh, th this restoration project was sounding like the reef had recovered as well. So it's a way of looking at the ecosystem from several different angles to get a really holistic picture of the recovery. Yeah, it was amazing to hear. So some of the sounds we recorded, we were very familiar with. Uh, so we know exactly, um, we've heard the sound many times before, we know exactly what fish is making it. We sometimes even know why the fish is making that sound. Uh, but we heard lots of sounds that we'd never heard anywhere before. And then I sent them to my colleagues and they haven't heard them either. And so it's this real scientific mystery. We, we've no idea what these sounds are. Um, and, and for me, that's part of the, 
the beauty both of doing this research because we're discovering new things every day but also the beauty of doing ecosystem restoration because you're rebuilding an ecosystem you're allowing animals to come back um, which maybe have never even been heard before but as long as the threats to coral reefs exist restorations may not make a very big difference in the long run Coral reefs are caught between warming oceans and more local threats like sediment runoff from land, uncontrolled development, cyclones, and overfishing. I also spoke to Tanmay Wag, a marine biologist with Dakshin Foundation, who's heading a project based in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which is part of a nationwide effort called the Long Term Ecological Observatories. As part of the LTEO, the Indian government is trying to observe what changes occur in ecosystems because of disturbances from human activity and climate change. This is what he had to say about why we should care about dying coral reefs. So in islands, a lot of fish that we find are known to live in and around coral reefs. And fish form a very important part of livelihoods, nutrition and stuff like that. So when corals degrade, fish automatically don't have the same habitat to live in, which results in the, you know, like a decline in reef numbers, which could affect livelihood, like fishing and stuff like that. Also in places like the Andamans, reefs are very important economically because a lot of tourism is centered around coral reefs, right? Uh, scuba diving, snorkeling, uh, underwater walks and stuff like that. Corals also form a protective barrier to the islands because they sort of shield like the island from waves and tsunamis and cyclones and stuff like that, which is of quite a lot of importance in island systems. So yeah, and they also form a big part of like the cultural aspect of people living in islands, right? Like people are known to do a lot of recreational fishing, a lot of subsistence fishing and those things also get affected. In the larger scheme of things, they also are known to be a source of various drugs and other chemicals which have a lot of medicinal uses. So that also gets affected. Even though the LTEO's work in the Andamans has been delayed because of COVID-19, the repository of information it collects over the years to come could help restoration and cons conservation efforts at a national and local level across India's coasts. The hope is that it'll help policymakers come up with measures to mitigate climate change and remove ecological threats to reefs. Most of India's coral reefs are found in the Gulf of Mannar, the Gulf of Kutch, Park Strait, and Lakshadweep, apart from the Andaman and Kobar Islands. The scale of restoring natural systems is huge, right? Like we are talking about thousands of kilometers which is probably beyond the scope of restoration. And unless we address the sources or the causes which led to us having to restore reefs in the first place, unless those things are sorted out, you know, like if, for example, there is another bleaching event that is going to happen next year, then whatever we restore is still going to get bleached, right? So it, uh, unless the points of the, like the sources of the problems are not addressed, then restoration only offers so much. But what it can do is it can be used uh, to complement other management efforts, right? So if there is a small reef which is degraded or if there is an area where we need to maintain connectivity between coral populations or genetic flow between different reefs. So at those scales, restoration does find, uh, find a lot of application. But again, like we, or at least I don't know of any demonstrable projects which have undertaken reef restoration activities at a large enough scale for us to say that, okay, in, you can restore these systems back to their pristine state. Both Tim and Tanmay stress that just because coral reef restoration projects are successful, they cannot make up for lost coral reefs and sustained efforts should focus on underlying threats. <laughs>